Hi everyone, um, here we are with Mary Taylor. Um, I'm so excited to interview her finally. Thanks so much, Mary, to be here. It's a delight, it's a delight. Thank you so much. Can I read your um, bio? I know sure. a lot of people know about you, but some people might not the depth of your background. So here, you, here we are, I'm just reading from your website. Mary Taylor began studying yoga in 1971. Soon after she came from, um, she came home from France with a grand diploma from Julia Child's cooking school. <laughs> I had no idea. Le Col de Trois Gourmand. Gourmand. <laughs> she found yoga. Huh? <laughs> she, she found yoga at first uh, as a means of finding equ equanimity during the stress of university, and it was the thread, that thread of balance, that got her hooked. It was not until 1988 and finding her primary teacher Sri K. Parabi Joyce and the Ashtanga Vinyasa system that she experienced, the profound and transformative impact that a dedicated and daily practice can have on all aspects of life. She continues to study and practice yoga and Buddhist teachings with great enthusiasm and inquisitiveness with an eye on how the residue that is produced on the mat and cushion through these teachings informs and supports all aspects of everyday life. I love that. Mary, Mary travels and teaches with Richard and within the caregiver and hospital setting as part of the Being with Dying program, Upaya Zen Center, and the Urban Zen Integra Integrative Therapy Trainings. In 1988, she co-founded with Richard Freeman the Yoga Workshop. Mary is also the author of three cookbooks and the co-author of What Are You Hungry For? Are You Hungry For? Women, Food and Spirituality and The Art of Vinyasa. Wow, thank you so much, Mary, for being here uh, with this you. amazing, um, well, 50, I was counting 50 years in yoga. Yeah, and a long time. Yeah, and longer with cooking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's really fascinating. I want to ask a lot of questions, but... Um, so it says that you found yoga, and especially Ashtanga yoga, that hook to your, like, maybe daily practice or deeper practice. But could you tell us how you felt when you started practicing Ashtanga Yoga, we, what was the difference and why were you so hooked to it? Well, you know, I think that it was the first time that uh, I had really practiced in a dedicated way. It had before that been sort of a thing. And in those days, it wasn't like modern yoga where it was everywhere, but it was just sort of like something that you did to stretch or to reduce stress or whatever. And you do it when you wanted to and, you know, that that sort of thing. And when I started practicing on a daily basis, and I think this would happen with whatever form of yoga one does, um, it started really uh, working on me in an internal way. Um, and I think that bottom line impact that I love about what yoga does is it opens up the truth of who we are inside that has nothing to do with our personality or our individual self or whatever. It's, it's a way of connecting deeply to human nature and through that to then connect deeply to others and mm. see the responsibility and the joy mm. of uh, connecting to others, mm. which is what I love about Yoga Gives Back. <laughs> is that you have seen into through yoga you have seen this uh, pathway that people can take to come out of our own little storylines and see what is um, there in the world that uh, could use some service and what do we have within our own capacity that we can do to support others hmm. and so that's really what got me hooked on it and and Indeed, it was because in the Ashtanga system you are supposed to practice every day, you know, that I did that. And, but I don't think it has to be Ashtanga. I think it's any form of yoga 
where you really are practicing and you start to fade into the background. Mm. Mm. That's interesting and profound. So um, do you think everyday practice was important initially? Absolutely. And but when I first started yoga, I didn't, you know, I was that was not really what I had understood. Um, but yeah, I think practicing every day and that doesn't mean that you as an Ashtangi that I have to do the primary series or whatever series I'm working on every single day. What I see that is meaning is that you have to take the tenets that are the underlying um, aspects of yoga um, that are the, you know, the, the ethical underpinnings and the insights into um, being alive as well as being embodied. Mm. Um, to me, that's what yoga brings that some of the other practices are less focused on is the, the aspect of being embodied and how does that then impact our actions and our um, way of relating to others. Mm. And, you know, you've been practicing for a long time, but how long did it take you to realize that? Um, you know, it's a gradual process. What happened for me immediately was because I had gone to India and studied in a setup that really wasn't a normal everyday setup, you know, it was, it was going there specifically to do that. Um, I had some very uh, sort of profound personal shifts uh, some insights into things that had happened to me as a tiny little baby before I was even pre-verbal and or as I, when I was pre-verbal and um, also insights into you know the way my breath and body work together um, or fought against each other if I didn't give them conscious awareness etc so it was for me it was you know the day the the luxury of being in a situation where I was expected to and could mm. practice on an ongoing basis. And then of course, being in an environment that was India, which is for those of us who've been there, it's, it's such an unusual and uh, sort of magical and, and horrible at the same time environment um, that it really woke me up to mm. paradox, to uh, to sort of the insight of tradition and long lasting um, traditions that have been passed down for generations. So it was, that's when it really happened for mm. me. So if we it weren't for your trip to India and learning Ashtanga yoga, would you have been a chef? That was your path? <laughs> I was a chef. Oh, um, you were? Yes. And, um, I, I think at that point, I had been a chef for many years. And then at the point I went to India, I had uh, kind of drifted off of that specific path of being a restaurateur and gone into catering and then teaching cooking and then um, had become a, a vegetarian. And which, because I was trained in France where at that time vegetarianism was just sort of not something anyone even knew existed. It was yeah. like, if you have a pear with some cheese, that's vegetarian. <laughs> and um, so I, I had moved into doing things like um, teaching other people how to cook and had, had, had become engaged with a very large natural foods store that was based in Boulder and then expanded um, to bring sort of more um, you know, a sort of more classical food approach into some of the vegetarian offerings that they had. Wow. So how did you step into vegetarian vegetarianism? Well, I had never liked meat as a child, <laughs> but my parents were English. And so it, any of us, and I was Catholic, it brought up as Catholic. So anyone who has had those, that combination <laughs> of things knows that on Friday you eat fish, on Sunday you eat roast beef. And I, in particular in those two meals i just couldn't you know i was called the finicky eater of the family yeah and it was it was just i didn't have an affinity for eating meat and then as but i didn't know any other alternative and so as i 
you know, came into my own, I started realizing, oh, there are alternatives. There are many other different ways that people eat, and let me try to explore this. Wow. Well, you were, you know, one of these uh, pioneers, you know, <laughs> now vegetarianism is such a mainstream thing and veganism yeah. has also become more and more mainstream, so especially in the yoga community. Mm -hmm. But you have studied this so long and I'm fascinated what you, your um, resume says about how the residue that is produced on the mat or the cushion through these teachings informs and supports all aspects of everyday life. Would you explain that a little bit? What you mean? Yeah. By that? So what I mean by the residue is, and I think anyone who has practiced yoga um, experiences some form of this, where you have this um, sort of spaciousness that you didn't even know existed inside of you, that is um, opened up in some mysterious way. It's almost an alchemical process that happens when you really start moving and f and bringing focused attention to the breath and the movement and um, the, the complementary opposites that it takes to move in that in and out of yoga postures. Um, and so many people uh, go into their first yoga class and have this sort of you know, almost a mystical experience. And then, you know, you try to create the experience again and again and again, which never works. But the, the thing that we can reproduce is the residue from that type of mystical experience where you have a sense of calm, where you mm -hmm. have a sense of, of insight into oneself and into others and into the nature of being. Mm -hmm. And the more you practice, the more those uh, awareness, those aspects of one's awareness, the more they are just sort of background. Mm. So that as I practice day by day, it's not like I'm trying to be more calm. It's just it, the residue is, that is part of the residue. Mm. It's not that I uh, necessarily try to see how can I help someone, but because that has been sort of woken up in me, this, this desire for, to express compassion, that, you know, then automatically starts to happen. Mm -hmm. So we often say, when you practice yoga, you know you're doing the yoga correctly and you found the right form, etc. When you become happier, mm -hmm. when you become nicer, <laughs> um, rather than, you know, more stressed out or yeah. not so nice, and so that's the residue that I'm talking about. Mm. And it, it does just, you, I think there's some incredible value of starting these practices in a safe space of the yoga mat, of, mm. of the yoga practice itself, and then sticking with it long enough to let it sort of filter out into life rather than saying, well, now I'm going to take it into life. Because mm. in fact, yoga is you know, every aspect of everything that we do, mm. if you allow it to be so. Mm. Well, physical is just an entrance, right? Entry part. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how did you become interested and so uh, devoted into studying uh, Buddhism? Well, I first, you know, I, I, after I got into yoga, even just a little bit, I started reading some of the philosophy and reading some of the texts that are related to it. And um, then when I moved to Boulder, the Buddhist community here is a very strong mm. community. Um, and so I started, you know, taking classes with different Rinpoches and people who were here and began to notice, oh, and recognize the similarities and the, the common roots of these two traditions. Mm. Um, and then maybe about 20 some odd years ago, I got involved with uh, Roshi Joan Halifax in the Being With Dying program, mm -hmm. which is an amazing program down at uh, Upaya Zen Center. Um, and so that was actually one of the real seed points for me to then go more deeply into the sitting practice and into looking at how the two traditions interface mm -hmm. 
and um, you know they're not identical mm. by any means but they are also very complementary mm. and so f I'm just fortunate to be in a place where there is a lot of yeah. um, Buddhist teaching that goes on and then I have this incentive to to study it and then like so many of us in during the pandemic you know I was able to take online mm. classes with people I hadn't you know, I've always wanted to study mm. with, but for various reasons, hadn't had the opportunity. So what exactly do you do at this uh, Being with Dying program at Upaya Zen Center? It sounds like, almost like Mother Teresa's home <laughs> for the dying. Well, what it sounds like that, but who it is, this particular program is designed for, and I've worked in other areas with people who are the ones who are dying, but this program at Upaya is designed for medical professionals who work with those who are in end of life care. Mm. And so what, um, and Roshi Joan has been, she began her work as a um, medical anthropologist. And so she has taken the Buddhist approach to uh, combine it with her medical anthropology work and has been doing this for 50 years mm. or more. Um, looking at how the medical system, particularly in this country, but in many parts of the world, is really broken. Mm. And how so many people go into the field of medicine and then with these great ideals and huge hearts wanting to serve. And then because of various factors and having to overwork and now with, you know, doing so much online, having to fill out all these forms, etc it becomes a very dehumanizing mm. environment. And so what I do is I bring it, so the program is really bad. And people who have been in this field, who so often have not had time to become embodied because they're working so hard and exhausted when they finish. So I, throughout the program, we start the day with yoga, mm. a short yoga practice, and then throughout the day during lectures and um, programs that we have all day long for the eight days, we take little short yoga breaks mm. where we stretch and breathe. And, mm. and so, uh, you know, it starts to be part of the self-care, mm. if that's a word that you can even use these days, mm. um, aspect of, of it. So we teach them the importance of contemplative practices in uh, becoming balanced themselves so they can be there in service of others. Mm. That's fascinating. So you you actually give tools to medical care providers. Of yeah. The, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, well, you know, when you go so deep in the yoga practice, um, it's like never ending <laughs> practice. You can just stretch out into so many different ways. It's so true. It's That's so, true. so wonderful. And what is, what is your is inspiration or aspiration as a yoga teacher? Well, I think, you know, that was is a great question that I've thought of, uh, about. And I think that the, the thing that really inspires me, there are a couple of things, but one is, um, as a teacher, one is interfacing with students. Mm. Um, and learning from the students. I see myself more of as a, um, you know, so, as a support system rather than someone, you know, telling people what they need to do. Um, and so what truly inspires me and what I aspire to do is to have a wealth of knowledge that is whatever I can manage to continue to keep adding to and then offer that um, in whatever way like to see who is there before me as a student mm. and to then not offer a lot of um, you know sort of things about or not tell them what they must do but see what I have in my bag of tricks of understanding this thing and then kind of offer 
what I imagine might be of best service to them. Mm. Um, and, and then seeing the response of students mm. as they start again, like I did many years ago, mm -hmm. start to wake up and start to question and start to have enthusiasm and start to really see the importance of taking care of the earth, mm. taking care of one another. Uh, and contributing mm. and that that's really what inspires me mm. that's great and how important is it to have Richard as a partner in this journey <laughs> oh well, I think that it would have I you know I've often wondered if I hadn't met Richard and um, I don't know what would have happened and and I believe you know we're so intrinsically involved at this point um, and we've, you know, written three books together and um, have taught together a lot and have a family together. And so we've gone through, you know, the easy parts of life and the real difficult parts of <laughs> life. And um, both have this foundation of real devotion to these teachings and to these practices. So I think, you know, I don't know how I could ever have done it without this particular path, you know, opening up for me. And mm. it was just, I was fortunate. Mm. That's so wonderful to have that partnership in the journey, in this journey. So finally, would you share if there's any like workshops or like upcoming events you want to share with the global audience? Oh, well, <laughs> we are currently <laughs> and you and I just had this horrible moment right before we got on. I'm <laughs> like, I don't know how to do Instagram. Oh, help! Um, but we're I'm currently being um, taught how to be more have more of our teachings online. Mm -hmm. So through our website, we are just in the process of opening up a lot more online stuff. But we're mm -hmm. also teaching in Thailand in um, November and December and March. We're teaching in Taipei oh, wow. in February. And then doing some little smaller things privately here in the US and in Colorado between now and when we go to, um, That's to wonderful. Asia. Oh, great. Yeah. So anybody who is interested can go to Freeman, Freeman Taylor Yoga. Right. It, yeah, and it's richardfreemanyoga.com. Oh, that's right. Freeman right. Taylor Yoga on our Instagram would be the way to do it, and we announce things there. Okay. And I'm also going to start because we've been talking about food. Oh. I have on our website. I have recipes. Wonderful. Because I can't help it. Yeah. And we've been looking at um, trying to get some cooking class types of things, or you know, or set up some things where people we might even have online live dining experiences so we're we're playing with oh, that oh fantastic yeah, i saw recently fun. like some quiche you posted yeah. it looked amazing <laughs> i'm like what yeah that's great we look forward to seeing that but thank you so much mary oh. for sharing your journey and also i'm so grateful that you joined yoga gives back um as an advisor i really yeah. appreciate your support well, it is, you know, I have watched you develop this over the years, and I am so grateful to you for for inviting me and also hope that I can contribute uh, what you're doing and, and for the lives of so many children and women. Um, it's really important, yeah. and particularly so in these divided times yeah. that we have. So thank you. No, thank you so much. It's, yeah. It means a lot to have a teacher and leader like you supporting our mission to reach out to your community because yeah. with ourselves, we can only, you know, go so far. <laughs> so yeah. I really appreciate yeah. it. Well, thank you so much, Mary. And thank I'm going to post this as a IGTV, this whole recording, so people can watch it again. Okay. Yeah. Well, Wonderful. please say hi to Richard and thank you so much and talk to you soon. Thank you. Namaste. Bye. -bye. Bye. Namaste.